Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Mr. Ruan Zongzhu, who is the Vice President of the China Institute of International Studies in Beijing, uh, People's Republic of China. Ruan, welcome to Berkeley. Glad to be here. Uh, tell us a little about your background. Where were you born and raised? Well, I, I was born in Sichuan province, which is Sichuan, of course, is uh, famous for its uh, Sichuan cuisine, Sichuan province. Uh, a small county in south part of Sichuan, I raised there. And uh, first, when I went to college, that city called Chongqing, which along the Yangtze River. So before 1986, I was living in Sichuan province. Mm -hmm. And looking back, how do you think uh, your parents helped shape your view of the world? Well, it's a very interesting question. You know, my parents, they didn't have much education. They even do, couldn't write a letter to me when I was in the college, which, I, of course, I was uh, uh, looking forward, they could do that, but they couldn't. So, they are, but anyway, they are very optimistic about their life, particularly about their future life. And, you know, we have a very large family. I have two sisters and uh, five brothers. So, mm, plus, my my, plus my parents, that's uh, ten members in my family. Uh, none of them make their education further to the college except I myself. So they told me you must uh, study very hard, work very hard, and uh, it will pay off in the future. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's done that. Uh, what got you interested in international affairs? Well, actually, I, I didn't know that. So what get me interested in international affairs. You know, first I went to college to study English literature. Hmm. Then after that, I getting a little bit interested in international news. So I applied for a, a master degree in the CAS, social science in China, but I failed in the exam. So I, but however, a couple of days later, I took another exam to the Yunmin People's University of China. Uh, fortunately, I, I passed the exam, so I went to study international politics in the People's University of China in, in Beijing. But after that, interesting enough, many of my uh, classmates, they are so-called in Chinese we call Xiaohai, that's plunging into the sea. That is to say, they like to pursue a business career. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I got that sort of interest, uh, so I carry on my interest on the, those research uh, business. Uh, going back to your, your interest in English literature, what, who was your favorite author? Did you have a famous in, uh, favorite English author? Well, actually, I, I read uh, quite a number of uh, English literatures. For example, I like uh, one of the American authors called O. Henry. Mm -hmm. He's a John O'Hare? O'Hare. Yeah. It's a short story. Yeah. Um, and also I like Jake London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's who who, who uh, grew up and lived in, in Oakland, in Oakland, yeah. right near here, actually. Yeah, he, he's a story about uh, those days in Miss, along the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, tell us a little about uh, your institute, the, the China Institute of International Studies. Yeah, uh, this institute actually affiliated to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it uh, roughly has about nearly 200 member staff there. And we try to cover the whole world. We have uh, seven divisions of studies, American study divisions, Paci Asia Pacific study divisions, Western Europe study divisions, and the Middle East, Africa, and South, South Asia study divisions and the Russia and the Eastern Europe study divisions. Apart from this, we have another two. One is called International Economics, or World Economy, I prefer to say. The other is International Politics, which they are more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. and, and so do you, do, does your institute prepare papers for the foreign mis ministry on uh, issues that the government you know, will be co covering 
uh, or addressing either in the short term or the long term? Oh yes, that's part of our job actually. We have, of course, our research projects are sort of mixture. On one hand, we ha we have to prepare those research reports which uh, has a policy recommendation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs even beyond. And a par other part is that we can do some research projects which we're really interested and to we are actively contribute our article and papers to newspaper and, and magazines and we very often, I mean our Institute staff are very frequently receive interviews with uh, television in China to, uh, let's say, to explain what they think, to join a sort of debate about international politics today. Mm -hmm. uh, China is undergoing enormous changes uh, in, in really all sphere, spheres, especially in the uh, economic. That must really have major implications for its international relations and more importantly for the study uh, of its international uh, relations. So th this must be really an exciting time for uh, your institute and, and uh, people like yourself who are trying to figure out how China fits into the world. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I can't agree with you more on that. And in the last 20 years, particularly when Deng Xiaoping proposed a policy of opening up to the outside world, that really transformed the, Ch the Chinese economy. And also the Chinese so society today is under great transformation. People's mentality and people's attitudes are changing a great deal. And I think this is also one of the uh, elements which also, I mean, such a dynamic China play an increasingly important role in the world affairs. And, you know, in the past, when China was uh, in a sort of, uh, particularly during the Cultural Revolution, a sort of chaos situation, we are much very occupied uh, by our own agenda. Uh, today, I think China is uh, more or less looking to the outside world, and we also want to be a very constructive player of the world affairs. And this is also uh, make us, particularly as a researcher of international politics, feel a lot of grip, a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to work very hard, and because uh, lots of interactions happened. And the job is mu very much demanding, and so a uh, lot of job we we must uh, let's say we prepare for the the foreign ministry the report for the foreign ministry, and we will also want to join the public debate about the foreign policy of China. So I think it it is a very exciting moment for us. So so you, to to paraphrase what you're saying, it, it's both. Uh, uh, new information requiring new understanding, but also because uh, you're moving toward a, a new kind of democratic formula. Uh, also involved is public education about what you're learning and trying to analyze. Well, I, I think it's uh, it's true that uh, when you pass the Chinese street today in Beijing or somewhere else, you can see lots of uh, news stand, which they sell newspaper and magazines. And all interesting enough, these newspaper and magazines, they are already, let's say, uh, the central government, they put them into the market. So they need to attract the readers. If they carry the same story, the same article, <laughs> they will die in such a competitive society. So they must have their sort of independent view on that. So they also, this is also provides a good opportunity for researchers such as us to write uh, commentary for them, to write an article for them, which they, they will say somewhat, uh, you, you can explain your more independent view on the world affairs. Mm -hmm. so, so that there's spillover into the, 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 the policy debates uh, and analysis that, that you're part of. Yes, I, I think so. And 
Here, I think I would like to clarify a point which some people even have the sort of misunderstanding that China still have one voice. I don't think that no longer we are no longer have that sort of luxurious anymore. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is a lot of debate in China, even about the, the foreign policy, about our policy towards uh, um, the, those world affairs. Because of the, I, I think one point is that decentralization, just because of the transformation. The other is that I think uh, lots of expertise are uh, coming out. We, we, in the past, we, we don't have that sort of expertise. Now, in the past 20 decades, many universities and think tanks are trained lots of expertise on this. Mm -hmm. So it also can make this possible. Uh, how important in all of this uh, is, are academic exchanges uh, with uh, other parts of the world, both in terms of students uh, learning, uh, but also in terms of, of senior academics like yourself? Well, I, th I, I consider it as a very important uh, part if you want to, for, for China, I think, from our perspective, we like to have a uh, let's say friendly relations with uh, other countries in the world. Then is to say to the United States. And uh, first of all, we should understand what the outside world think, and how particularly importantly that how they are look at China, what their expectations, what their concerns about China, and. Uh, Currently, I think it is even more important because China is seen as a rising power. So many people were concerned, what's your um, long-term plan or what are we going to do? Put it more simply in the future, once you grow stronger. So we must try to understand other people's concern and their expectations so we can, let's say, um, do our job uh, let's say we can increase our mutual trust with the other countries to expand the common interest, the ground, common ground, and reduce those differences. This can make China be a, really a constructive player in the world affairs. Now, in, in your personal life, you've been uh, uh, abroad quite a bit. You, you've been uh, posted uh, uh, in uh, the embassy, I think, in, in London. Uh, how has that particular experience broadened your horizons as a scholar? Well, I think um, what impressed me very much uh, my experience working in London and also my occasional visit to, to the state is that we need a sort of a debate uh, atmosphere. That's very important. In China? In, in, in China. And uh, I'm very glad to say that we, we are starting to have this sort of atmosphere. Um, to make a policy, I mean, more, let's say, more accurate or whatsoever, it needs to debate before the actual policy was formulated. So it would be good for us, I mean, particularly in the academic level, to debate some of those big issues before they can be transformed into a policy of the government. So, so what you're saying is that because of all of these influences, changes in China, new expertise, opening up of a competitive market in ideas, uh, openness to the outside world where you're, you're learning different perspectives and so on, that, that there's a real kind of, we say, synergy, uh, a dynamic uh, for uh, making it not a good idea to judge China on the basis of what it did in the past. Is that correct? Well, yes, I, I agree. And because China, as we just talked about, it has undergone huge or enormous transformation, of course, uh, started by economy. But such kind of transformation, start from economy, will definitely has its uh, huge impact on people's way of thinking, their ideas. And uh, of course, for those people who become rich, they may have more say. They, they may want to have a bigger voice on the public policy debating. Uh, and I think this is 
what happened in China is to make us feel very exciting at this moment because we can be part of this policy debating. Uh, now, if we, if we look down the road, and, and as a student of uh, international relations myself, one would, would have to say that uh, uh, some of the forces at work don't relate to a particular country, but just sort of the structure of the international system. And, and if we look ahead, it's very clear that there are going to be uh, three uh, centers of power, so to speak. Uh, the United States, and we're used to being the only center of power, but we're looking at also China uh, it, with, uh, with enormous wealth and population, and we're also looking at a united Europe in the, in the future, uh, which may be further along than China today, but, but, but the, the future looks to be one in which these three uh, entities will really be important. Now, you, you, were, uh, uh, <clears throat> you were stationed in Europe, and one of your areas of expertise uh, is Europe. Talk a little about how you see that dynamic bet between these three uh, centers of power unfolding in the future. Well, it's a uh, very interesting and a very complicated issue, but I, I try to explain what I think about it. Uh, for, particularly for Europe, I think the the way the integration in the past half centuries of European Union it sends a strong signal that for Europe, unity is a power for them because uh, most of the countries are small or medium countries, so they want to have a. For, for Europeans themselves, they always have a dream that they want to have one voice. Of course, they have different languages. <laughs> but anyway, they pursue such kind of dream. And I think the integration of Europe, it is uh, actually a political decision rather than economic one. Of course, the economic decision is always in the, in the spearhead. We, we have seen that from the, the 50s, six countries, and now in, in the pretty soon, next year, we will see another 10 Eastern and Central European countries will join the European Union. So it will make the European Union from 15 to 25 members. So this will, I think, add a lot of weight to the European Union to have a stronger voice, an independent voice, uh, something like that. Comparatively, European, I think, their idea, my understanding, that they want to have, a, have their own independent voice. This is uh, something I, I, I think in, in their mind. So the, they are so consistent and push forward the integration. And uh, of course, the euro already is the, the currency. The euro is uh, one of the milestones, I mean, in this integration. Um, but on the other hand, other side of the coin is that European is a, is a sort of combination by 15 or even 25 sovereign countries. So they have a, a huge amount of homework to do before they can really achieve to have a one voice on international affairs. It's interesting enough, if you look at the economy, they can do that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But if you come to the foreign affairs and the security issues, they may have greater difficult, particularly those three countries, I mean Britain, France, and Germany. And so they may have a different view on that, particularly their uh, the stronger or such kind of a European Union, their relations with the United States, I mean the transatlantic relations. Um, during the Iraq war, we have that one of the casualties of the Bush administration's foreign policy is a drift, it is a rift, sorry, it's a rift of the transatlantic relations. That also reflects, I mean, the Europe, they want to have their voice, but I think that they still have a long way to go. Now, uh, speaking of uh, the Bush administration, uh, Secretary uh, 
uh, Rumsfeld coined a phrase in old Europe uh, which uh, was less reliable versus a new Europe that was more willing to join the uh, uh, the coalition of the willing, I think he called it. Uh, what do you make of, of that uh, trend? Is it just kind of a short-term bump in a road, or uh, are there longer-term uh, issues involved here uh, that China has to look at, obviously, because it, 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 that, that would be an important rift, as you say. <laughs> yeah. Um well, I don't know what really, I mean, from Europe and Americans, they will see that. But from my personal perspective, I don't think that is a good idea to divide, to say that there is an old Europe and a new Europe. Because I think it may send us wrong signal to the Europeans. Why did I, did I say that? Because I think in the past, the United States was seen as a uh, supporter of European integration because a stronger Europe may um, share more burden with American and it will be a stronger ally of the United States when encountering with the Soviet threat in the Cold War. So in the past several decades, Europeans, I think that they have a very positive idea how American be supportive in their integration. But to say there is a division between New Europe and uh, Old Europe, it seems that uh, the United States is no longer a supporter of the European integration uh, rather than a, a sort of disturbing element because you artificially divided these two. And for the Interesting enough, for those so-called New Europeans, I think it also put them in a sort of uh, embarrassed, uh, they feel very embarrassed because actually they like to join the European Union so that the European Union can provide them a good opportunity to develop their economy. I think this, this is something they're really looking for, I mean for New Europeans. Um, but on the other hand, they have to keep other eyes on the United States. So it really makes them very difficult to make their choice decision. But finally, in my point of view, those so-called New Europe, they have to be more inclined with those so-called Old Europe because ultimately they like to have a better chance to develop the economy that European Union can offer that rather than the United States can do. One of the conflicts between uh, uh, the U.S. and Europe is a basic uh, uh, disagreement about how you achieve world order. Uh, the Europeans, building on their experience of integrating and uniting Europe, believe very much in negotiation, uh, believe in a process which they're calling enlargement as they bring uh, new members into the community. Whereas the United States, uh, especially after 9-11, seems to heavily emphasize uh, the military dimension of uh, securing world order. So, so that was a very basic agreement. How, how does China perceive uh, this disagreement on the one hand, and then on, on the other hand, who is more right, do you think, about what the long t in the long term the world will look like in terms of reaching uh, a sense of order? Well, if you look at uh, the, this situation, a long-term view, I personally, I, I think it uh, should be more to take a multilateral approach. This is something I think the European has done in the past 50 years. They started from six countries to the now in the future will be 25 countries that take this step gradually. And each step that may compromise, each step that should have lots of involved, lots of lots of negotiation and the bargains. So unilateralism really doesn't pay for that. So from the half centuries experience of Europeans' integration, I think they came to understand 
those multilateral negotiation and the multilateral approach will be the sensible way to pursue greater uh, interest of Europe. On the contrary, I, I think American side, particularly Bush administration, after the September 11 terrorist attack, of course it's a very tragic uh, incident, uh, attack, it seems that they prefer to take a, a sort of unilateral approach. And this sort of approach, in my point of view, yes, you can do something in a very short term, but you cannot achieve your ultimate interest or result in a long-term view because there is a lot of feedback. If you look at what is happening in Iraq today, and you, it is very easy to top down Saddam Hussein regime, but it, it seems that it's far more difficult to put a, a new alternative for that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, of course, the world was really changed by 9-11. Uh, and and uh, that uh, uh, affected uh, the U.S. obviously very greatly because it was a, an attack on our on our homeland. Uh, how has uh, those events affected U.S.-China relations? Well, I think it, it did affect these relations. You know, before. Bush took uh, his office in the White House, and uh, Bush himself, it seems that to pursue a sort of policy called ABC, that's anything but Clinton. Mm -hmm. So he wants to <laughs> distance himself from what the previous government done with China. So he, he limited China as a strategic competitor rather than strategic partner for that. Of course, this is very irritating for, for China. And, uh, Okay, later on, there are a couple of things that happened to put Sino-U.S. relations into a really low web. That is, the uh, airplane incident and uh, the Taiwan sales a large quantity of weapons to Taiwan. But this, I mean, September 11 incident and make the United States realize that the real threat to the security of the United States is rather from other countries, I mean from China, rather from uh, Russia and these countries. But they're actually they are from those terrorist group, which these terrorist group are globalized, I mean globalized. So the, this sort of new form of terror, uh, new form of security threat is quite different. In the past, you may have a designated country which can be a sort of a security threat. But now, you cannot say a certain country is a threat, but it is a sort of terrorist group. Some individuals, that can make a huge attack, such as uh, September 11. I think that, well, the, the impact, I mean, it's a rather positive, I would say, because since the, the threat of perception has cha has something cha somewhat changed, and secondly, I think China and America, America and China, realize that they can cooperate to fight this terrorism. That both China and the United States have the common interest to fight for that. So, the September 11 on one hand, you lie to America. And on the other, you like other countries with the American to stand shoulder by shoulder to fight this terrorism threat. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, was was in in uh, did did those events and the the re resulting changes in American policy uh, affect the dynamic in the debate uh, uh, in China about? Uh, uh, its relations with the United States? Well, very, very interesting question and a, a very important one, actually. And I think uh, there is some debate, uh, as I said before, that in China, uh, it's China's, how would China cope with uh, the change of American foreign policy? Well, basically, there are two views. One is that such kind of positive trend of the Sino-US relations currently um, well, it will last for years to come 
because the th the terrorism threat as a as an enemy of common enemy, you, you cannot just uh, rule out it you know, overnight. It will may take years to to tackle that issue. Mm -hmm. So the other view is that probably what American change its policy towards China or any adjustment its policy towards China, it's maybe tactical. The whole the view because. Uh, uh, it seems America has a more immediate threat, that is a terrorism threat. Mm -hmm. Once those terrorism threats have done, so they may someday turn to China. So this is a, you can see the difference, there is a, also debate in China. And I also find it's also very interesting here in the state, you have a debate, it's policy towards China as well. Mm -hmm. Basically I, I can put them into two schools. Why that the United States does share a large or vast, vast common interest with China, um, terrorism, um, the, how to deal with the nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula and so and so. But on the other hand, there is still some people that say, well, China may pose a real threat in the long term. This is something they called so-called offensive realism. Mm -hmm. They hold this view. John like, Mearsheimer. Yeah, they, 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 they say that the tragedy of great power politics. So this is a, another view to look at. But my point of view is that now we have a chance to work together. And this chance won't be go away in the next a couple of years. We have to, but we should not take it for granted, we must work very hard to grab the chance, to realize this chance. That is to say, we have uh, many other issues to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Cooperation can increase the mutual trust between our two countries. Cooperation on fighting on terrorism, cooperation on the global, to, to tackle those issues on globalization, environment, and uh, more immediately is cooperation on the Korean Peninsula, how to solve the issue there. So this all provides good opportunities for us to work together. Along this process, we can build up or cultivate our mutual trust. That is very important. So, so if if one uh, if if parties on both sides, that is on the Chinese side and the American side, want uh, to further the the cooperative way of uh, of engaging with the other party, then the key is success in particular issues. Basically, you seem to be saying that, in other words, we, 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 we work together on issue A, then there is a hope that a, a, a body of trust will be built up so that on issue B, uh, uh, the opportunities uh, uh, for resolving the issue increase. Well, I think um, sometimes we let me put it in this way. Of course, hopefully, we can be successful in every issue. Mm -hmm. But in reality, sometimes uh, you can't just do that. And, uh, but I think the process of cooperation is uh, equally important. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, we know in the United States that uh, 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 ideological perceptions of the other can limit the openness to change. This, this is a comment about the United States, but I presume this is a, 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 an issue that one finds in other countries, even your country. That, 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 that in other words, that, that it's this dynamic, this debate of ideas is the key to move beyond whatever ideological blinders keep one from, from defining a new way of approaching each other. Well, probably I may look at it in, in different ways. And you know, in China, Deng Xiaoping has a saying, a so-called so the cat theory. Mm -hmm. No matter it's a white cat, or black ham, as long as it can catch mouse. Mm -hmm. That is very important. So <laughs> we no longer to debate so much about the ideology or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to be 
show of that. Mm -hmm. we, we look, we, we become more realistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, debating on those sort of things from Deng Xiaoping's perspective, it will be time consuming. And uh, during pr this process, you're just uh, debating without uh, doing anything. So we will lose the chance. So what we will to do is that, since it's uh, Okay, it is a, a problem. We can debate it later. But first of all, we should concentrate our mm -hmm. energy and mind to, to do those work. Mm -hmm. now, now, the big after 9-11, the big problem, so the, the big mouse, or, but it's more than a mouse, it's a rat, is, is the, the, what you were talking about earlier, namely that terrorist groups that are not states will uh, get a hold of weapons of mass destruction. And the Bush administration has made the argument that that requires uh, preemption uh, on our part uh, as a way to deal with the issue, whether or not uh, we get the cooperation of the international community through the UN. Uh, what is your analysis of the, the pluses and the minuses, and maybe there are no pluses, to the, to the doctrine uh, of uh, preemption. What are the costs for the international system? Well, I, um, it is a very important issue. And uh, now, currently, you can see, to some extent, it dominates the international politics, particularly from the Iraq war. Uh, in my point of view, I think well, there is some rationale behind the preemption doctrine. I think I can understand them because the threat is no longer the same as they used to be, and you, you can't just fight back as they attack you. So there is lots of rationale. But the problem is that who can make the judgment? And how about the mandate? And also, if presumably such a doctrine are also applied by other countries, how this world system, this world order will be? Shall we return back to the sort of state, state of people, I mean, in, in Hobbes' terms, as uh, everybody fights everybody? So the consequences is, uh, I, I think we should be really attach great importance about how it will trigger maybe probably the chain reaction from mm -hmm. other side. Mm -hmm. So so what you're really saying is that you 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 can understand the thinking behind the doctrine but you you fault it for its understanding of the long term implications, what you call the chain reaction uh, of other states adopting a, a similar kind of policy. Well, it, it is also um, put a pressure on the international, current international system, because using a force, I mean preemption, ultimately means you can use force to attack uh, somebody else. That is a huge problem, I mean, very, very big problem. There are some boundaries according to the legislation, according to international relations principle norms, and so and so. So it is a really, I, I think, a, a very big issue to tackle that. What I want to say is that though there is some rationale behind it, but I don't think it would be a, a good idea to pursue that way, because the long-term chain reaction and the, the probably chaos it can cause to the international uh, system might cost much more than it pays. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when we when brings all of this together, uh, uh, the, 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 a major case study both for Chinese-American cooperation, for dealing with uh, rogue states, for dealing with issue of terrorism, is North Korea. And uh, th there are no kind of quick fixes that one can see on the horizon. So I guess what I'm curious about is how we can build on our discussion and ask what a process of dealing with the North Korean uh, issue 
uh, looks like uh, uh, where both the United States and China are participating and we, one has a competition of ideas within China, within the United States, and then a dialogue between uh, the, the two countries. What are your thoughts on what progress would look like in Chinese-American uh, cooperation in dealing with the problem of North Korea? Well, it's a very important uh, uh, in my point of view. And, uh, you know, in early this year, China hosted a three-party talk involving China, United States, and the DPRK. And uh, last month, I mean, in August, uh, we held uh, the six-party talk. Um, so many observers, I mean, observers of Chinese foreign policy noted that China took uh, a very real initiative in dealing with these matters. And for China, I think we just uh, could not afford to see any conflict happen on the Korea Peninsula. That's the last thing we want to say. And also, we have close relations with, uh, on one hand, America, uh, South Korea, Japan. On the other hand, we also have good relations with the DPRK. And I think to solve this problem, I agree with you, there is no quick fix on the horizon. But we must do something. And I think the six-party talk concluded by a sign agreement, I think that are very, very important in the future. Uh, for example, the first uh, agreement is there should be a, lo a nuclear free Korean Peninsula that's strongly endorsed by every, I mean, including DPRK themselves. Secondly, such kind of process, non-nuclearization process, must be handled through dialogue and negotiation. Thirdly, these two processes must be pursued um, simultaneously or on a synchronized way. I think the problem between DPRK and uh, the United States, they don't have even a maximum minimum of mutual trust. They don't have any trust. Mm -hmm. DPRK never trusted the United States, vice versa, the United States trusted DPRK. So I think the synchronized way of taking step can, to some extent, build up the mutual trust, which is necessary if you want to have a, a, res a tangible result in the future. So it is a very thorny issue, very daunting issue, but we have to work hard for that. And uh, happily love that they also reach agreement in principle that this six-party talk will resume in about two months, probably in October. They will let me hold another round of talk. As long as we can talk, as long as we can negotiate, I'm confident that we can finally find a way out. Now, uh, one of the Bush administration uh, concerns is that uh, not uh, giving aid or resources, not talking about military resources, to a party uh, a state like North Korea before they have actually acted positively. So there's a there's a, a chicken and egg problem here in the sense, well, who moves first? Yeah. Uh, and uh, in order to indicate that you're moving down that road of building trust uh, and. Uh, North Korea, of course, if, if one believes what one reads about that country and, and the evidence is really overwhelming, I mean, there, there's, a, there, there's a, a particular style and way of operating that, that is beyond ideology uh, and is one in which uh, the leaderships 
uh, rationality and its relations with its own people really must be questioned. So, so how do you how do you act in that context? I mean, it it it's uh, uh, it, it, it's it strikes me as a very kind of difficult situation where these words about building up trust and so on are, are hard to to pin down. Yes, uh, it is very difficult. It's uh, actually it's a hard lot to crack. But I think what we have done already give us some signal that we can be more creative to tackle the issue. Let me give you an example. Before the, I mean the six-party talk or three-party talk, an American's view is that they want a multilateral talk, okay, with the DPRK. They don't want the bilateral. But for the, from the DPRK's perspective, they want to the bilateral talk. They just want to talk to the United States. But what happened? We have a three-party talk and a six-party talk. It seems it's a broad framework of multilateral framework. Mm -hmm. But under this multilateral framework, the United States and the DPRK did have their bilateral talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, under this framework, for about 40 minutes mm -hmm. or 35 minutes, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is a sort of creative arrangement. Mm -hmm. And I think it just refers back to your question about who moves first. I think it, uh, one of the agreements reached in the six-party talk last month in Beijing, the important point is that they should move in a synchronized way. I mean, simultaneously, you cannot just say, you move first, then I will do this. Mm -hmm. You move that, I do this. So it is sort of a way, probably it will be better for them to take, at the very beginning, to take a very small step or and simultaneously in order to show that they have to build up their political or mutual trust. Because as I put it, they don't, I mean, DPRK and uh, American, they didn't have any mutual trust. So that is a big enemy, big obstacle to solving the issue. In order to solve the issue, they need to have built up some trust mm -hmm. on them. And so they can move a little bit uh, simultaneously. And I think that the other parties, I mean, the, the rest of the four, they can be a sort of uh, play a, a role to somewhat to, to monitor this, this process. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think the issue of Korean Peninsula issue must be solved between United States and uh, DPRK. The other parts, including China, is uh, I, I think we can do, we will do whatever we can to be helpful uh, any settlement for this. But the both DPRK and an American, they are the, the ultimate uh, pr two sides to solve this issue. Uh, as you were speaking it, I, I, I actually thought back to what we were talking earlier about Iraq, and it seems that what is emerging here is the idea that uh, the bilateral context uh, has to uh, interface with the multilateral context. It may not be one or the other. It must. It, it may be finding the appropriate moment in diplomatic time for uh, using one or the other. But but they have to interface. Mm -hmm. They have to connect. So the bilateral part cannot reject the multilateral part. I, it just struck me that there seemed to be a similarity in in uh, uh, in those two ways of thinking. Another. Uh, issue that is is very important for uh, uh, U.S. China relations is the issue of Taiwan. Taiwan. And I want to approach it in a, in a different perspective, more from a kind of a theoretical notion of international relations. Because the issue of, of Taiwan and of Hong Kong and of even of Palestine may 
uh, may have similarities. I'm just asking you to, to think about this in the sense that we have to think of new forms and new formulas for dealing with a problem which recognizes the interests of the parties concerned but at the but the but the but the uh, but the solution comes up with a new formula which protects all the interests. The solution to Hong Kong being one example of uh, a case where uh, Chinese sovereignty was restored but with some respect for uh, the way Hong Kong had evolved over time. Would you comment on that if, if uh, or, or am I throwing too much at you at one time? <laughs> well, I, I think for, for Hong Kong, the, we practice the one country, two system. Actually, these principles are first uh, proposed by Deng Xiaoping to solve the Taiwan issue. But Hong Kong became the first place to make it to realize. I think the for Taiwan issue, it is, uh, I, I think m I have never been to Taiwan. I actually, uh, what I know is the indirect sources and information from that. I think we, two sides are really needs more interactions, more understanding. That's very important. That is China and the United States. Uh, China and, and the United Thai. States, not China and uh, the the, b both sides uh, across the strait. I mean, Taiwan. So that's why I think the large number of Taiwanese now, that they are doing business in China, and a limited number of uh, China, mainland people from mainland can visit, visit Taiwan, these are very conducive to their mutual understanding. And so I think in the future, the Taiwan issue, well, I, I don't know how long it, we, we can solve the issue, but in my point of view, as long as we can increase the mutual understanding, particularly to the both the people on both sides that's very important they can contribute to the final solution of this issue and i think a people's to people exchange contacts plays uh, extremely important role for that mm -hmm. what what do you think is the most important uh, point that you would like uh, citizens of the United States to understand about changes in China and China's foreign policy? Well, uh, there is a saying that uh, if you want to understand China, love China. <laughs> and explain that for me. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I can explain yeah, that accurately okay. or not. Oh, okay. But uh, my understanding is that, well, from my personal experience, I have strong interest in studying U.S. foreign policy mm -hmm. for, dec uh, for more than a dozen years, actually 15 years. And uh, when I was f first visit, when I my first visit to the United States, um, for me it gave me a sort of impression that uh, a sort of puzzle. On one hand, the United States has a very developed economy and high tech and so and so many, many things which are the envies of other countries. On, on the other hand, I think uh, sometimes the United States, its policy, particularly to other countries, are so American centrism. Mm -hmm. So that is- American centric. Yeah. Ameri uh, uh, sorry, American centric. So they do not pay enough attention to other countries, their concern, their interest and uh, or even their way to to protect their legitimate interest so i think i have a very strong interest in studying american foreign policy for in, in the past uh, 15 years but still i think i have lots of lots of homework to do and but as i just mentioned if i, I really want to understand america i like I love America. Mm -hmm. So, so what you're really saying, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to draw this out of you, is that at, at one level you have to put yourself in the other 
shoes, basically, to see the world as they see it in order that you can move out of those shoes and actually deal intelligently uh, uh, with, uh, with that other, that country, in your case, the United States, in our case, China. You know, my impression when I visit the States for a couple of times already, I think a strong idea in my mind is that China and the United States must work together. We must accommodate with each other. So in order to do that, sometimes you must put your shoe, put your feet on the other shoes. I mean, to exchange the role, like us, if we can change the role a bit, so we can think, we can look at the other side from different perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. one, one final question requiring a brief answer. How, how would you advise students to prepare for the future, uh, both in terms of international relations, but in terms of, of China-American relations? Well, um, well, I don't know if it is advice or not, but from my very limited personal experience, I think it uh, will be advisable to have uh, lots of contact with the country which you are really, or with the area which you are really interested in that. And uh, you have, uh, like the, I mean, like the culture, I even get familiar with the culture, the language, and all this will be conducive to, I mean, your understanding of the international politics. Mr. Ron, on that note, uh, I want to thank you very much for coming here today, visiting the campus, and, and sharing your views on uh, U.S.-China relations. Thank you very much. My prayer. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.